Comparatively, most African governments are able to collect about 15% of their GDP in taxes against the 40% being collected by European, Asian, and North American countries. However, given the massive demands of developing African countries, this low level of tax collection jeopardizes the continent's socio-economic developmental progress. Low taxes generated and collected by African countries are partly attributable to the underdevelopment of African countries' tax management systems. These inefficiencies are impeding efficient tax collection and management. And there are several factors that limit the collection of adequate domestic taxes across the continent. But there is hope and progress as Africa's tax systems are undergoing a digitalization. As part of New Central's collaboration with the West African Tax Administration Forum, today we're looking at strengthening Africa's tax systems in a digitalizing world. Joining me is Joy in Dubai. She's a research associate at the WU Global Tax Policy Center at the Institute for Austrian and International Tax Law, Vienna University of Economics and Business. Joy, welcome to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very, very much. So whether externally or internally, I think we can all acknowledge that the continent does have a very serious issue with tax collection. Uh, some countries fare better than others when it comes to this. But let's start with looking at the factors that limit adequate tax collection uh, across the continent. Joy, take us through these. Um, well, I think first and foremost, uh, of course, there are multiple challenges. But I want to point out that we shouldn't view countries as homogeneous. We're talking about 54 different countries with different contexts. So it's very important to always place these discussions in context. But um, having said that, there are common or shared limitations or obstacles to realizing a domestic resource mobilization to its full potential. The first one, I, I think, and perhaps the most important one is taxpayer morale. Um, oftentimes people are discouraged from paying their taxes. And I would say one of the most important factors has to do with uh, the prevalence of corruption and generally illicit financial flows and the inability of governments to deal with these problems adequately, which means that um, whereas revenue should be shown to be working for the people, so public services are well financed, um, the government is functionally op it's operating adequately. Unfortunately, corruption uh, and other financial crimes have been an obstacle to this. So this can then lead to taxpayers feeling that they should not be paying their taxes or wanting justifications for why they should pay their taxes. Um, but other than the issue of corruption, taxpayer morale is also generally affected by the, it's, it's also about the willingness to pay. Uh, and informality has been a big factor in this question of the willingness to pay, the willingness to comply with registration uh, um, obligations as well. Um, accountability and governance also fit into this taxpayer morale and link to the taxpayer morale question uh, very strongly. So we need an accountable government that can show you what they're doing with the money they collect from you. Mm -hmm. And we require good governance uh, standards to be adequately met. Um, you know, the identification of the tax base and strengthening of the tax base is also extremely important. Uh, tax authorities often don't have enough capacity to adequately um, evaluate and understand the tax base. And that means that they focus on very small percentage of the tax base that's currently operational. So only a few companies are being taxed. Uh, a wider section of the economy is not being taxed as well. And this is a big question about what uh, digitalization can do. And as we go on with the discussion, I'll talk about why it's very important for helping in strengthening the tax authorities' understanding of the tax base. Okay. And as I've said, tax authority capacity is very important. So inadequate systems, inadequate data collection, inadequate abilities to actually evaluate the data they have available is also very, very important. Um, tax authorities today are dealing with a wealth of data. Uh, one, one might say it's an ocean of data. And if they don't have the tools to actually evaluate that data, uh, and tools is not just the human capacity, it's also the use of technology to evaluate the data and identify any risks that are being realized, any potential tax evasion or avoidance that's arising, then uh, again, you're not able to, to collect the revenue, you're not able to close the loopholes. Okay, so you've laid out a long list of things, but I think one of the biggest questions then would be uh, this digitalization drive that we see happening across the economy, uh, whether it's in the tax systems or in areas of key strong institutions, because that's also been a large part of the conversation that digitizing Africa uh, is a key to stronger governance, stronger accountability, and stronger institutions. But I think someone would ask, with this litany of issues and challenges, is digitalization?
reformation of the tax system enough to address the challenges when it comes to particularly low revenue uh, collection and, of course, the adequate mobilization of taxes in the right direction? Is sort of digitalization the silver bullet in this situation? That's a great question. And when we talk about digitalization in the tax space, we always say that it should be viewed as part of a larger strategy with governance and establishing good governance. So you cannot just introduce it in a vacuum. It must have complementary reforms that accompany it. So for example, I've already said that accountability and governance will be very important. You need a secure system. You need to ensure data privacy. You need to ensure that taxpayer rights are respected. But you also need to ensure that the potential for illicit financial flows, the, the loopholes that lead to illicit financial flows are also addressed and adequately dealt with or the risks are mitigated. Um, an additional fact is actually about human capacity. You need to also ensure that people understand the digital systems that are using. They have the capacity to utilize them. We know that our operating systems are able to use that type of a system with um, a process of training uh, the public, building awareness, and generally building a culture of the use of technology. So I, I have to say that um, the strategy for digitalization should be part of a whole of government approach to improve governance systems in general. Mm -hmm. And the tax authority is just one measure of that system. Okay. So let's look at this a bit in a historical context. And as you said, Africa is not a continent. While we may have some common issues uh, together, but in the contextual situation, countries are facing different uh, circumstances and situations when it comes to their tax systems. So, uh, Joy, are you still with me? All right, unfortunately, it looks like we might be having some technical uh, issues there with the guests. Yes, uh, I am. I hope you can hear me still. Fantastic. So, Joy, my next question to you is this. In terms of progress, uh, have you seen progress being made on the African continent when it comes to the digitalization of tax systems? In terms of even looking at some of these homegrown yeah. solutions, we talk a lot about African solutions to African problems. Are we seeing models of tax administration across the continent that uh, other yeah. African economies and countries can pick up? Are we making progress? I would absolutely say that we are making progress, and and I'm glad to say that Africa is not just not a continent. There are multiple countries, and there are different stages of, of progress to be made. Um, and we've seen a lot of use of e-invoicing, for example, through VAT systems. We've seen a growth in e-filing systems, so people are now able to comply with their tax obligations online. You can file, you can make your payments online. Um, there's a lot of facilities that are being introduced and with the focus on taxpayer services. So there's a huge focus on service provision towards the taxpayer in order to encourage them to comply in a much easier way. Previously, manual systems were extremely, they would take a lot of time, they're extremely difficult to comply with. If you need to make any amendments, it would often be a very difficult and rigorous process to follow through. So I absolutely think, I mean, you can see it in countries like Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, even in Nigeria, a lot of West African countries, but um, as we progress, tax authorities are focusing on how they can use technology to improve compliance. And that's from three various, three different perspectives, monitoring compliance, understanding the tax base, so defining compliance as it is, identifying new taxpayers, and then of course, in the service provision perspective, so facilitating compliance and making sure that they are more accessible uh, to the taxpayer. And I have to say that that's a really big part of creating trust between taxpayer and tax authority and creating more accessibility and responsiveness with the tax authority. So I have to say we are making progress. Of course, more needs to be done, mm -hmm. but we, we should understand that it's a broad and long-term strategy that has to be followed step by step in a phased way. Okay, so the digital economy has received a lot of attention. And once we've seen a lot of attention, particularly from governments headed in that direction, as people have predicted, there are several attempts across uh, different economies to tax the digital economy uh, in different ways. What does this particularly entail? And do we see sort of a correlation with the growth or the digitalization of African tax systems with an attempt and uh, several probably... Um, realistic attempts to actually digitalize, uh, rather tax the digital economy as well? So I, as you might already know, the debate regarding the application of the digital economies has been, I think, quite controversial. 
it is a very globalized debate because we're talking about com companies that are not physically based in our countries oftentimes. Um, and, and it's important to understand why it's important or, or why it's significant for any tax authority. One is that uh, the digital economy has generally created new business models and new value chains. And all of these business models and value chains need to be understood by tax authorities. That means that they need more access to information about these business models. They need access to information about the nature of income being earned, the way it's being earned, and how it's being distributed around the company or with the individuals involved. Um, and because of this, it requires a level of cooperation that we perhaps haven't engaged in in the past. Um, of course, globally, there are structures and there are standards that have been created around the exchange of tax information, for example. Uh, but now we're moving into a stage where we need to understand more about companies that are not physically located in our countries, but are, is quite controversial because there's a huge chunk of taxation that could arise from these companies. Um, what has happened is that countries have created different solutions. For example, we have the growth in VAT uh, on e-commerce on, on e or e electronic services. We also have um, the, the, the rise of the digital uh, service tax. And this has been rather controversial. Uh, Kenya has a digital service tax as we speak. Uh, in countries like Nigeria, we've created the concept of uh, an economic presence based on different factors that allows for companies that are considered digital companies to be able to be considered to be tax residents in Nigeria, in a country like Nigeria. And this has been problematic uh, at the global level. Uh, what has been happening at the OECD is that they've been trying to reach agreement about a shared solution to taxing these types of companies okay. and generally other multi types of multinationals. Um, I, I, I hope I'm not going too deep, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to continue. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> At all, because what you're helping us do is even widen the conversation be beyond uh, the scope that many of us are seeing, which is widening the local tax nets and deepening tax penetration as well. But there's this global aspect to the conversation. Uh, but Joy, because of time, won't be able to take much further. But I do expect we'll be having you back, especially as you're touching on the digital economy, taxation around that, and how African countries who do not have these companies located in their borders can still find uh, some amount of tax revenue coming in. Uh, so I'll just say a very big thank you for joining me now. Thank you so much, Joy, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I look forward to having you back. My guest was Joy in Dubai, Research Associates, WU uh, Global Tax Policy Center at the Institute for Austrian and International Tax Law at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. And tax is a conversation you're going to see happening a lot right here on News Central on Business Edge. And of course, our partnership with the West African Tax Administration Forum will be delving into tax issues across the continent. And that's it on Business Edge for today. Social media at New Central TV, website www.newcentral.africa, and of course, download our app on Play Store and App Store. At 12 p.m. West African time, you have New Central Now coming your way. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adela Rubalogun. We'll be seeing you sometime soon.